Welcome, welcome everybody to the Tuesday edition of the Not Your Average Investor Show. Today we're doing a long-awaited show. People have been requesting this one for a long time, and it's asking about behind the scenes on a property turn for a rental property investor. We got all the details for you. I'm your host, Pablo Gonzalez, and to give us the deets, the dish it, how the sausage is made, oh. we have the Portfolio Management Supervisor. She's been here six years with JWB, originally from North Carolina, AmeriCorps volunteer, <laughs> oceanographer, but now she is the queen of property turns. That's right. The, the maven of moving people around. I didn't think that one through. Allie Ting, welcome yeah. to the show. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Happy to be here. <laughs> Happy to have you too. And as always, we have our amazing community manager. We call her MTM because she brings us the moments that matter and because her name is Madison the Magnificent. Hello, Madison. Hi, everybody. And happy to have the community in the house. We we see the we see the ticker going up. We see people joining. If you are joining us right now on YouTube or you're listening on the podcast, just know we always show this thing on YouTube as well. We're putting a lot of effort into that channel to be a real resource for everybody to just like organize the materials, find the best moments from the show. So if you get a chance to subscribe to the YouTube channel, maybe like one of those things or or leave a comment in there, we'd love to have you. And now it's time for the tradition. You know how we start the show, Ali? With the roll call? We got our leadoff hitter hitting us <laughs> off as always. John Henning in the house. We got Lauren Elman. We were just talking about Lauren a second ago. We got Lita Song from Minnesota. Lita, good to have you back in the house. We got Chris Lee from Fernandina Beach. We got the mama bear of the community, Cody Adams in the house. Good to have you. We got the early bird, Dean Curry from Columbus, Ohio. We got the Shaw man, Nadim Shaw from the Pacific Northwest. We got the MVP. You know who the MVP of the community is? Is that Lee Bishop? It's, Lee Bishop. it's absolutely Lee it's Bishop. Lee Bishop, but he's famous. We got uh, our, you know, he always checks in with that. Hola, damas y caballeros, Bill Shields. Good to have you, Bill Shields. Shelly Johnson from B Town, Bradenton. Good to have you. We got the Mountain Man. Uh, have you ever heard of Mountain Man? Oh, <laughs> Billy <don't>, Green. Yep. <laughs> mm -hmm. Billy <laughs> Green from the mountains of Colorado. Laura Colby in the house from Washington State. Welcome back, Laura. Who else we got in here? We got a got a full roll call. Peter, Sir Peter James from the beautiful Commonwealth. We tip of a we tip the hat to to Sir Peter James Absolutely. When, when he's around. He deserves it. Big Papa's in the house. We love it when he calls in. You know Big Papa? Oh, Greg's Mr. Dad, J. Mr. J. Cohen, Greg's dad, Maddie Rigar. Good to have you, Maddie. That's a new name. Is that a- Portfolio a, management. A teammate. Mm -hmm. I, I assume when the teammates show up, the team when we shows know. up before. Yeah. Absolutely. We love that. We love that. We got right along Raj. He was my ride along partner on the meetup. Raj, good to have you back. Our favorite name to pronounce, Aaron O'Neill. Into the lights, Aaron. Good to have you here. Who else? We got the ringmaster of the Natural Average Investor Show community, Drew Barnhill. Man, everybody's checking in. I love this. Good roll call today. Valerie Dawson checking in with the high friends. Is Valerie someone you know? Absolutely. Teammate. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Allie was telling me that everybody's everybody's checking in for her big debut. Although technically not your big debut. You've been seen. You have graced the screen. I have. I just have not been in the formal studio yet. So this is a, a privilege, an honor. The lights are hot, are they not? They, it's, uh, yeah, <laughs> this is a full production. It's cooking. It's cooking. <laughs> All right, excuse me. Allie, again, we have many, many questions. I want the community to be, you know, this is something that you have asked for a bunch and uh, we want to make this as useful for you as possible. So make sure that you use the Q&A. Any questions you have about property management, property turns, anything like that, pop them in there and we'll answer them for you. This is an interactive show, mm -hmm. but I know that you've been asking for this for a long time. So let's just, let's get right into the details of it. Talk to me about the process of a, a resident turnover alley. First of all, you know, what's, what's your purview on it? Kind of like, what's your, your day-to-day -day role here? How did you become the expert in this? Yeah. So I am on the portfolio management side with JWB. So, so we're kind of broken down to where you have your property managers who are going to be really resident facing and then your portfolio management team is going to be all investor client facing. So we all work together, but we all specialize in different areas there. So with JWB, I have been here for, for going on six years. And I started as a portfolio manager before becoming a supervisor of the team. So I have been involved walking clients through, through one of the hardest times that you're going to face during an investment is a vacancy and paying to turn it over. So okay. really walking through the details of that, making sure that I think transparency is just going to be key with us always making sure you know what's going on and that you have a team that you trust to, to take care of it all for you. When you first joined the portfolio management team? Did you know what a turnover was, right? Like what, what was your kind of like 
understanding of this thing. Yeah, no, I just kind of assumed it magically happened or that everyone moved out the way that I moved out and wanted my full <laughs> security deposit back every time so that the home was immediately rent ready the second that someone moved out and then someone else moved in. But there's so much more that goes into <laughs> it. <laughs> Let's talk about that. All right. So just bring us kind of when do when does when does the JWP team start getting involved when it comes to like a turnover? When is it triggered? Yeah. So it really starts from when the residents lets us know that they were going to be moving out. So from there, our team is is using our software. Everything speaks to each other through Salesforce. But our property management team is going ahead and saying, okay, here's when the resident's lease is ending or if they're moving out early for any reason, when the resident is going to be vacating the home. And then really we want to talk through the whole process from yeah, there? Yeah. Go. Okay, cool. So, I'll, and I'll stop you if I got questions. Yep. Yeah. I per perfect. Trust it. <laughs> yeah. So we have so then if the resident says I'm going to be moving out on September 1st, then we are scheduling for the home to be taken possession of. So we have a team that is specializing in taking possession of the home and really their big piece is okay, I'm going to make sure that I go there. I'm changing the locks. I'm making sure that the home is secured. And I'm really doing a full photo report of how we received the property back from the resident. Okay. That's going to be most important for the intent to claim process for the resident security deposit is how did the resident return the home compared okay. to how they received the home when they moved into the property? Okay. So step one is showing up the day of their move out, making sure that they moved out. Yep. Changing the locks so there's no funny business after the fact, and then documentation so that everybody's on the same page of how this property was left, mm -hmm. essentially. Right? Exactly. So the resident knows that they're not going to get hosed. The 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 property owner has visibility into everything that's happening, and JWB is able to document all of this stuff, right? Exactly. And that would be something, if I was doing it myself, I would have to do that, right? Like that that has to happen. All property management companies do this kind of thing or people that do it themselves or do people just kind of trust everybody to be as good a move out or as Ali King? Ideally, yeah. they're doing this. <laughs> yeah. I, I can't say that everyone's changing locks, which comes with its own, I'm sure, issues there, but we sure. that that's important for us. And then photos are going to be really important for just a whole just liability process, making sure that we're doing everything right and really to show to our investors of, Hey, I'm writing a scope of work. I also want to show you what you're paying for. Not everything's going to show up in photos, but having something to match your scope of work for what you're going to be paying for is, is super helpful in having those conversations with clients that can't be here themselves to see it. Got it. So first level of coordination is just making sure that they're leaving and then coordinating with a locksmith or being a locksmith yourself in order to change something like that, right? That's yep. first level of effort. Okay. Yep. So that happens. You take, they've moved out. You've taken pictures. Everybody knows what the property looks like. There's new locks on the door. What's next? So from there, that is then when we have a project manager and a scope writer, they are following the route of that possession team almost to a T. So they're saying, okay, here's the route of any homes that we're taking possession of today, tomorrow, within the next few days. And then we have a scope writer, a team of those with JWB, who they're going to kind of be following that route so that we can get that scope of work over to the client almost immediately when we take possession. That's the goal is to limit the amount of time that it takes from the resident to move out for us to know what's going to need to be done to get the home back in a rent ready condition. What do you mean by following a route? Yeah. So Jacksonville is large. Okay. So oh, <laughs> we will have, yeah. if we manage, we manage right around 5,500 homes right now. So if we have 50 move outs happening in the same week, they're going to be strategic about that to make sure that they are doing it as efficiently as possible versus just got hopping it. around all over the city. Got it, got it. So that's kind of like an internal logistics thing. And I imagine most people move out around the first of the month, first week of the month. Right? Yeah. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. Got it, got it. Got it. Okay. So pictures are taken. Scope writer walks in and is it kind of like a home inspection, but with a different skill set? Like somebody's going in to see the status of the home to then understand what needs to be improved and then create a report that reflects the improvements that are needed to meet a specific standard that JWB already has predetermined? Yes. Yep. Okay. You're nailing it. Okay. Yeah. Next. So they're walking through there. <laughs> they're going to walk through the home and they're going to identify what needs to happen to the home to get it in a rent ready condition. There will be some areas where they will factor in and budget for contingency items. So say uh, plumbing just isn't working. If they are not necessarily the plumber, they're going to kind of use their expertise and their experience of doing this for years over so many homes to say, I know that it's probably this issue. I will let the professional determine that, but I'm going to go ahead and write in a, a cost code for that 
so that the client is budgeting properly for it on the front end. Got it. So I'm assuming, does this person have a checklist of things that they need to check and a checklist of things that the property needs to end up having kind of thing? Is that what it looks like? They do. So we have a a normal livability standard, which is going to say, this is what the home needs to have done to it to make sure that it is, it's livable. So do I have working heat and air? Do I have lighting? Do I have plumbing? Is everything up to, to code as far as a safety standard goes? And then we're going to also make sure that the home is, is somewhere that you would want to live and that you have renters who are going to want to live there too. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what they're doing. So they're going through and saying, okay, here is everything that we need to be, that needs to be done to the home to, for us to be able to release it back on the market for a new resident to move in and for it to be rent ready for them to be able to move into right away. Okay, cool. So you have a professional scope writer. They are like one part home inspector, one part scope, you know, like proposal writer. Exactly. Right? So yep. it's, a, it's a unique skill set, which I think is interesting to mm-hmm. have in the house. They write the scope that day. What happens next? So from there is when it's going to be imported in. So it's really helpful working with us because we're going to have a lot of fixed line item pricing. So we know how much your paint's going to be. And that's going to be calculated based off of square footage for what painting is or flooring or carpet or pest control, cleanings, anything like that. So they're going to go ahead and do that, write the scope, say, hey, here's everything that needs to be done. That is then imported into our same software to then your portfolio manager gives you a call as a client and says, hey, I just sent you over the photo report of here is the condition that we received the home back from the resident. I want you to pull that up. I also just sent you over the estimated scope of work. I want you to pull that up. We're now going to walk line by line through every single item on there. Make sure that you're super comfortable with with what it is. We want you to know what you're paying for in the transparency. And then from there, we're going to address any questions live on the phone. And then as soon as we have your approval and contribution on it, then we can get the project started right away. Got it. So I'm doing like a, in my head, I'm doing like a mental do it yourself checklist, right? So it's like show up to the house, make sure everybody leaves and whatever politics that involves, Mm -hmm. replace doors, take pictures of everything and document it, inspect it, write a scope on it, and then go through line by line deciding what needs to be done and what won't be done as a you know, to get like a sign off kind of thing, right? Yep. Also, another thing to add is we have stuff in place that is normally resident responsibility uh-huh. that we go ahead and, and take care of when it goes vacant. So you think utilities are normally in a resident's name. We go ahead and oh. make sure that those are set up to fall into our landlord account so that mm-hmm. the home isn't ever without power. It's really hard to write a scope if you yeah. don't have power in there, plumbing, working, everything there. We are going to go ahead and get it set up on a mowing rotation grass grows very fast here in Florida and the city is happy to violate you for, for tall grass if it's out of order. So we go ahead and have that set up and then we have cleaning set up as well. Okay. All right. So you have like a, it's like a concierge take care of all the little things, right? Do you guys have a direct hotline to the utility, to the utilities in order to do this thing (laughs) or does somebody spend uh, 40 hours a week on hold? No. So we, we, we luckily have the account that is set up. So then when the resident gives notice and we know when they're moving out, we go ahead and set that up ahead of time so that it automatically defaults into our account. Okay, cool. Cause that's my biggest nightmare. So anyway. yeah, it is. If you try to call offline for a question, yeah. we have no workaround for yeah. it, but <laughs> the account shifts, we've got that down to a cool. now. Love that. Love that. All right. So handle all the minutia of switching accounts, making sure that there's no gap in lawn mowing so that there isn't a fine get the scope approved, and then? And then. So the scope is approved. So we're going to go ahead and present the scope over to you as a client. You approve it. Then that's when our team, we then will have a project manager who's going to oversee all of the vendor coordination. Their goal is to make sure we are getting quality work done and then kind of keeping the the amount of time that the home is vacant to a minimal. So right now our average for turnover, so from the time that I have your approval to the time that that turnover is completely done and it is on the market ready to be rented is at 11 days. Oh, wow. Yeah, so it moves pretty quick. Normally that's how long it takes to get one vendor in and out of yeah. there. But our project managers, they're there to, to pretty much just oversee the project, manage the project, but that's really what they're specializing in is arranging the timeline saying, okay, I can't do flooring before I do painting and thinking of all of the order of operations and they've got that down. So they know that they're doing it in the most efficient order to get it done quickly and to not have to, to work backwards and do work more than once. So your project managers are like, kind of like mini general contractors. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Talk to me about like a typical scope. Like what is, what is happening in in that like list of move out to happening. Well, give me, give me like a tip because I hear 11 days and I'm like, 
I can't do anything in 11 days. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So some things that are going to be on every scope of work is it's, it's going to be things that you think of how you want a new resident to receive the home. So some items are going to be cleaning. The home's always going to be cleaned. Mm -hmm. We will always do an HVAC inspection and we will always do pest control. Okay. Those are going to be really important items because we want to make sure that when we are having a new resident move in, that we say, hey, we checked all of these items. So if you have a resident who has been in there for six months and now there's an HVAC issue and it is directly correlated to not changing your filter or not clearing your drain line. Mm -hmm. If I didn't do an inspection before you moved in, there's no way for me to say that that was your cause. That could have been the resident prior. So a lot of it is getting a clean bill of health for the home for the new resident to move in. And then really anything else is just going to be, does everything work? A, do all of your switches on your appliances work? Is your refrigerator, is your refrigerator running properly? <laughs> yes. Is all of your plumbing working? And really just does everything look good? Am yeah. I going to try to rent this home to you while there are holes everywhere in the wall? That means that you can then return the home to me with holes in the wall. So okay. I, I really want to provide a new resident a product that they're going to want to live in and also provide it back to me, knowing that they're going to be taking care of the home. Is there, do most houses get interior paint job? Like, are you going in and painting it? Yeah. So painting is going to be really popular now within the past couple of years, we actually upgraded our paint to a new product. It's called a super paint. So yeah. what that is, is to where a lot of it, it's almost washable paint to where if there was something on the wall, a scuff that previously or with a, with a different product, you would have to paint over it 100% of the time mm -hmm. we can clean it off. Oh, wow. Yeah. So wow. that's been a really huge upgrade for us and a product that's, that's newer to us that has a little bit more cost up front, but when you look at it over a long period of time, it saves you a lot of money. Interesting. Okay. All but, right. So then yeah. 11 days from move out until making it all look really nice. D does, does that sometimes go further? Like if there's like a bigger repair that needs, like if there's like extra holes in the wall or things like that? Internally, that's going to be pretty much it. Sometimes if it's going to be externally, it's going to be Pest can be a big one. So if there's fleas, you can legally only treat fleas every certain amount of days. So that can say, okay, I need to wait a certain amount of days before my team is even getting in there because your vendors aren't going to go into a flea infested home to start painting. They're going to make need to make sure that that piece is cleaned first. But everything else, sometimes if it's permitting, that can slow it down a little bit. But that 11 days, is an, it's an average that we've had for a long time. And it's something that we're going to just continue working to get down, but okay. that's pretty standard. Okay. So that's, so that's 11 days to get the home ready to then have people walk in and then out decided they like it. Right. Yeah. Do people ever, I, I guess, I guess just talk me through the rest of it. Yeah. Yeah. So from there, and that's 11 days from when the client approves it. So uh, okay. if, if you yeah. decide that you're going to take a, a 30 day excursion through Italy and you're turning your phone off for the time, that means that I'm you're hopefully communicating that with me ahead of time because you know that you're about to have a vacancy and we have made a decision on yeah. your threshold that you're comfortable with us approving it for. And and how generally, how far ahead do you know that there's a vacancy to make sure that the owner is kind of like online for that time window? Generally, the residents required to have a 60-day notice, so we know in advance. So if you know that you're going to have a vacation coming up, we know that. Now, if there's an ev eviction possession, those can kind of happen more on court's timeline or, or a sheriff's timeline of when they'll actually be there. So we know that it could be any day, but the exact day may not be as we won't have a two months heads up of when that day is going to be. But for the most part, we're going to have a month to two months to know when that date's going to be. Got it. All right, cool. And that uh, Shelly Johnson was asking that question. How much does a resident typically get? And if renewing, how soon does JWB start negotiating new rent if they're renewing. You know that one? Yeah. So we start looking at our new rent rates. So we run about two quarters in advance. So in October is when we will have our rates ready for April, April, May, and June. Is that, yeah. April, May, and June of, is when we'll start talking through those rent rates. Or no. Yeah. No, that's a lie. We will, in October, we'll start looking at January, February, and March rent rates. And we start asking residents to renew at that time, but that's the timeline that we feel comfortable knowing what the market rate is going to be realistically for when their lease ends. Is that in, is that part in your department? Are you doing that stuff? The rent rates? Yeah. The renewals and stuff like that. We are communicating that to the client Okay, of saying it, okay. but we're not talking to the residents about that. Okay. Yeah. Cause I, I know like GC's talked about like how 
y'all look at renewals almost like it's like another sales department. Like it's like a well-trained how you do that stuff. Yeah. So we actually have a someone who specializes in a comparable market analysis who is going to be running through all of the rates where we're at. They're looking at your, your turnkey deal evaluation on the front end to make sure that we are getting in that three and a half percent annual rent appreciation for you, even when it does go vacant Okay, awesome. or when it's time to renew. Okay. So that's the renewal department, which yep. is a separate department. Focus on just yeah. renewals, right? Renewals forever, and then you never need to know about the property turn side of it. There you go. There you go. That's the best. That's the best experience. <laughs> exactly. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So now, where were we? Oh no, but that is something to take into consideration too, because sometimes if we are going and we're doing a turnover on average every four years mm -hmm. for a resident, but sometimes you're going to run into situations where they do renew for years and years and. Now you're doing a turnover for a resident who's been in the home for 12 years. Mm -hmm. That can look a little bit different. You're just going to have no more normal wear and tear, which also means there's stuff that you're not going to be able to claim from the resident security deposit because that is just natural for someone that has occupied a home for that long. Got it. Got it. Okay. So then there's a, there's a correlation between length of time that they're in and how much security deposit you likely get to have. I, I, I guess, is it normal to take out of the renter security deposit or do they generally walk away with their own security deposit? Yeah. So we have a specialist for that too, okay. who they specialize in the entire, it's the process is an intent to claim against a resident security deposit. So if you were to do a turn on your own, that's something that you'd want to seek legal counsel for because there's different timelines with Florida statute of how long you have to create it. You have to have confirmed receipts before you're making an intent to claim. You have to allow the resident a certain amount of time to dispute items, but it's a whole process that's included with your JWB service to be able to handle the intent to claim process for you. But what is happening on that end is you have your specialist internally here. They are taking a move in report. So the house right before the resident moved in, they are comparing that to the photo report of how we received the home from the resident. They are then taking that same scope of work that the client approved. Mm -hmm. They're going line by line and saying, okay, what's normal wear and tear for how long the resident's been in there? What is above normal wear and tear? And then what is actually direct resident neglect? And then they are taking what the client paid for it. And then they're mailing that out to the resident. And then they have a, a certain amount of time to dispute any items. Got it. And then they're going from there. And then that's when funds from the security deposit can be reimbursed back to the client for repairs that they paid for. So you could say you essentially have a security deposit specialist on staff, exactly. which would just be another mini thing that if I was doing it myself, you know, like that in itself being its own department and its own kind of like incentivization and skill set. Yes. And keeping up with regulations and whatnot. Yes. Is, is it is a really keep track of. It is a skill set that those people do. They can look at a report and almost guess it, but then they're going to go line from line and and really be, it's tedious and it's detailed, but it's what sets us up for success. Got it. I am not going to test well for that position. <laughs> yeah, just, just throwing it down there. Okay. So, so that's where we're at, right? We have scoped this thing out. The work has been done. It's 11 days later. Where are we now? So from here now is when you're going to have your, if we're, if we're on the final day, that project manager is saying, Hey, my project's good to go. We then have a quality control coordinator who's going to go to the property and they're really walking it and saying, okay, I have this scope of work. Is this client getting what they paid for? And they have their whole checklist and they're going through that. That's also the opportunity for them to say, is there something that we didn't put on the scope of work that we still need to get done now? Okay. That doesn't really happen, but that's what they're there for is to find items. They're almost like your home inspector who's looking for stuff to be wrong. That's almost what they're looking for. So, okay, what is the scope of work approved? Let me make sure that all of these boxes are checked. If they are all checked properly, then that is when we're going to go ahead and release the home to market. Is that the same person that wrote the original scope of work? It's a, it's a different person. It's a different so, person. Yep, they're so you gonna, have multiple checks yep. and balances of just like person that writes it, general contractor that shows up and manages it. And then person that shows up afterwards to like quality control it and make sure there isn't anything else in their yeah. purview. And they're checking your work. Yeah. Checking your work. Yeah. Wow. Okay. All right. This is an interesting classroom. <laughs> okay. So then after that work is checked, what happens next? Uh, yeah. So from there, if there was something that wasn't checked off, they're going to immediately go with their project manager who that kind of high prioritizes that vendor if they didn't do the work to get out there right away to make sure that everything is done properly. If it's good to go, which in majority of the cases is going to be good to go, then that's when we are releasing the home to market. So an email goes out, 
The portfolio management team is letting the client know, hey, great news, your home's officially released to market. Then our photography team is getting out there and that's also every everything is all included there. So your photography team is getting out there. They're going to be creating the 3D tour. Okay. Which then that's kind of our after photos for the client to say, you got your possession photos mm -hmm. to see what the home looked like originally. You paid for the scope of work. And then now you have this 3D tour of your property afterwards. That serves as like, a, this is, I got what I want. And it's also my marketing to go get a new resident. As exactly. Well. Yep. It's your marketing. And then that's what's going to automatically then hit, hit the market and, and get the ground running. So when it's released, we are putting that sign in the yard that says it's ready for rent. And then it's going on the market immediately from there. And once that happens, you're done. Well, then <laughs> from there, we will we'll continue talking to the client to give them rental updates regularly until we do have a deposit on the home. So it's not a sit and don't hear anything from anyone and just wondering if it's rented. We're going to keep you in the loop of here's how many inquiries we got on the home here. We also have an available homes team. They're going to go out and check on the home while it's vacant to see if there are any items that maybe are more cosmetics. So maybe it's not anything that would have impacted rentability on the front end, but maybe the home is sat for a little bit and it's something we we could do to spruce it up. And that's another separate person, another set of eyes on the property who is looking at it differently. When you when you use the term turn, yep. is that turn, is that contained in like the remodeling and what needs to go into the property? Or do you think about the turn as like vacancy to occupancy? Just a, from like a technical standpoint. Yeah. So the turnover for me is the actual project. Is time. the project. Yeah. Cool. Yep. Yeah. So yeah. from when we write a scope to when it is released to the market, that's the turnover Got for it. me. And then that's that's when you're thinking about like all these different moving parts. Then it becomes something else. Then it becomes yep. like a marketing and like a showpiece. Yep. Then from there, you're, you're going to have it marketed and then you'll have a deposit eventually. A resident will place mm -hmm. a deposit on the home. And then they'll move into the home. So a deposit holds a home for 30 days. So if I go to view a home and I say, I want to move in tomorrow, great. Let's sign the lease tomorrow. If, if you're approved and you go through all of the underwriting and everything there, mm -hmm. then you sign your lease or it could be up to 30 days. So right now our market to move in. So 11 days from the time you approve the scope of work to when I get it on the market. Mm -hmm. And then from the time it's marketed to that resident is actually signing their lease, you're starting to get rental income on average right now is about 56 days. 56 days. Okay, cool. So that is, that's normalized from when it was like 20 days, like in 2021 or something like that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. Yep. So, so inventory is a little bit different. There's a lot more homes on the market right now. So competition is there, but that's also considering that they could be placing a deposit and then I'm not still showing it for 30 days. So if you take that 30 days out of the equation, that's 26 days of showings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. So it's, I mean, it's, so essentially from move out date to turn to market to move in, sounds like about a two month expectation yeah. right now yeah. on average. Okay, interesting. We got a bunch of questions. You want to jam on some of these questions before we get into some more stuff? Yeah. That was, a, that was a super detailed process. Thank you for that. Yeah, of course. I'm, I'm exhausted thinking about it. <laughs> well, hopefully we're not exhausted listening to it. Well, what are you, what are you, during that time, what's your role in all that? Are you just basically kind of like getting an update every single day and relaying it to the, to the property owner or what's, what's your, what's your role there? Yeah. So once our, our biggest piece is making sure the client knows it's happening because that, or when it is about to happen, because that is what's going to set us up for success to get mm -hmm. approval as soon as possible possible because that's going to play a really big role in this. I can get the turn done in 11 days, but if I can't get approval from you for mm -hmm. weeks, then my hands are tied. So yeah. that's really going to be the biggest piece that my team plays is making sure that you're prepped. You know that it's coming. Mm -hmm. I'm letting you know, hey, we just got possession. That means I'm going to have the estimate momentarily. Yeah. So so be ready, be by the phone. Let's go ahead and talk about it. Yeah. And then making sure that you're you're answering or asking all of your questions so that you feel good to go so that we can get started. But at that time when I'm presenting the estimate, I'm also knowing what my estimated days are for how long the project's going to take. So if I say, hey, this is your scope of work, this project's estimated to take five days, you can expect to hear from me next week. If it's it. estimated to take 11 days, then really I'm just letting you know on that 11 day mark, if it got pushed out, that's when I'm letting you know why and when we what our new expected release date is. If I think about this thing on like a visual flow chart representation, mm -hmm. it sounds like you're in charge of communications. And then there's like a daisy chain of like mini projects that happen back to back to back to back. Yes. Right. Which each with each person controlling each project, communicating with the next one, they then own a mini project, own a mini project, own a mini project. 
And your job is to know when each mini project is over and make sure that at that point, the, the owner is informed and if any decisions need to happen, they're available to make the decision. Is that about accurate? Exactly. Yeah. And I think the cool thing is now, now, if you would have passed me 60 years ago, there was a lot more of a manual piece in it, but a lot of that DAISY is now connected with automation. So when I click approve that I'm approving that estimate, that automatically flows onto a chart for my turn team to know that it's available. And then they're incentivized based on the estimated days that they put out for that project to hit those days. So their clock starts then that counts weekends, that counts everything. These, yeah. these 11 days do. Days. Yeah. So they're getting started as soon as possible. Cool. Awesome. All right. Let's get into some of these questions. Yeah. Nish Dama, Nadim Shah is asking, is the turn the same between about four to 5k or has it gone up or come down? What do you, can you tell me about like the average numbers on turns these days? Yeah. Yeah. So it's actually really interesting because we just pulled some data recently looking at it from over the past three years. So 2020 to 2023, where we're at right now, rounding out numbers and Industry-wide construction prices went up a lot between then. So those prices went up about 35%, but our turnover prices went up 11.6% okay. in that time. So that is also paired with your rent rates going up 25 to 30%. So if I'm looking at a, at a net, we're still net positive, but compared to construction industry-wide, that increasing so much, we've been able to, to keep it pretty low. And that's because we're our one, we have relationships with our vendors, but two, we're able to offer them such volume and work and it's guaranteed pay. You don't know yeah. all the yeah. time if yeah. your people are going to pay you, but yeah. So this year, our average is, is right around $4,400 for the turnovers. Okay. So the average right now is about 4,400 bucks for which, this year, yeah. for this year, which represents a, about a 10% increase of, of recent history. And, you know, that's data. We like to talk about data with perspective on the show. Yes. I don't know if you listen, I, yes. but I know you listen. Top listener. Yeah. Top fan. <laughs> if you look at that and you think construction costs have gone up 30% and you just think about that linearly, you would have expected it to be about $5,200, but mm -hmm. it's not. It's $4,400. And that is because JWB, we talk about this all the time, the economies of scale of being the thousand pound gorilla, me having come from the construction world prior to my job, my, you know, like my career in marketing, if you call it that, is really understanding this supply demand of contractors and how much contractors value the steady work, value the the, the person that spends the most, most regularly. Mm -hmm. And that person's ability to leverage that consistency in favor of their clientele is kind of like where that value is created. So because JWB is the person, the, the entity that spends the most, you know, they're the biggest client for, for all these contractors and you're so well organized and you understand how to like, you know, play the game that leads to costs going up for the whole world and costs going up just a little bit for JWP clientele. Exactly. I love that. Yep. I love that. It's one of my favorite things about all of this stuff. Cause I know I've been there before. I've, yeah. been, I've been the little guy and I've been the big guy. Right? Well, and it's just, I mean, it truly is. If you're, if you're out shopping that market on your own, you're going to say, yeah. okay, I spent this much in flooring in 2020. And now it's a 35% increase just <clears throat> based on, on just your industry standard, but we're able to, I think it's also nice that you just know you have someone fighting for that. We have return expectations set out for our clients and we're going to hit those. So that's, that's a priority, something we're going to prioritize every time. Yeah. And it's, you know, that is just one piece of the pie, right? Because it's one thing that they're not making up for their material increase based on your price point. Yeah. It's another thing that they're like showing up. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And fast. And yeah. like, that's, that's a big part of it is we're, we have different vendors for different products, but we're really working with their scheduling. And that's another person we have specializing in this. And she's, she's a rock star with knowing what vendors are going to place where based off of their other schedules and knowing that that's not going to impact how long your project takes based on their availability. So being able to shift it around there. Yeah. So this idea that the average turn has only gone up 10% while the rest of the market's gone up 30% is only one part of the data that is great about JWB's economies of scale. Yeah. The other part is that 11 days from like property from vacancy to, to, to handing over the property to market is the compression of that time because you also get that preferred treatment and you get that coordination. And then the other thing is the spe specialization of labor. We talk about all the time, right? Somebody that's in charge of scheduling, somebody that's in charge of estimates, somebody that's in charge of all these things, you get kind of like the best on the way in throughout and pricing point 
because of the economies of scale. Yeah, it just happens. I Let's know. go. I love that. All right, cool. Good, 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 complete answer. That checks off something we we're supposed to talk about later. Check. I love it. <laughs> MVP Lee may have heard of him. He says, I love to hear that JWB creates a scope of work for a term. Is that a document that is discussed with owners or is it just the items that need to be priced out to give the owner a choice? Sounds like it's a, all right, I'll let you answer that. Yeah. So the scope of work is, is a document that we will give to the client. So we're sending it over to you ideally to be able to review it together so that it's not something that just pops up in your inbox and you're making your own assumptions about what it is. We want to make sure that we're there to really walk you through it just because it's verbiage that we're going to be super familiar with. So we are able to share that with you as a client up front. And that's that's what you're approving. So it's a document that you get. Got it. All right. My friend Bob Wiesner is asking, I wanted to offer a quick testimonial. Maybe he's not asking anything. He's offering a quick testimonial. Perfect. And thank you to JWB. In mid-July, a resident, one of my of one of my JWB houses evacuated Vacated, vacated. I'm sorry. I'm... I like evacuated. Same thing. <laughs> vacated, mid-lease. JWB quickly inspected the property, which thankfully was in pretty good shape. Got it ready for leasing, found the new qualified tenant, and had the tenant move in and pay rent by August 1st. In other words, JWB turned the whole thing around and got higher rent in less than two weeks. This is substantially better than I typically do on myself manage properties in St. John's County. All right, Bob, that's we, awesome. we manage properties in St. John's County, Bob. You bring it on over. We'll take it right off your plate. Careful what you wish for, Bob. <laughs> All right. um, MVP Lee's got another one. Is that concierge service paid by JWB or does the bill get pushed to the owners during the turn? Yeah. Who's, um, you just talked about all the service. Is this like extra fees for handling all this stuff or kind of like what, where, where, where does the cost go here for, for the owner? Yeah, so there's not an additional cost for for the possessions or anything like that. Where there is a cost to JWB is on your turnover, on your scope of work. There's a, a management fee on there. It's 10% of what the project is. It caps at $500. Okay, so say it again because I was responding to Lee saying something in the chat. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, no, but we, um. so it is a, there's a construction management fee okay. on your scope of work and that's what pays for JWB to do the project. So okay, it. it's a 10% fee, which is still under industry standard, but we also cap that at $500. Okay, there you go. Good stuff. Dean Curry, the early bird from Columbus, Ohio says, occasionally I get mail from code enforcement about tall grass. Shouldn't they know that JWB is the PM that handles this? The city should know that we are there, but <laughs> the helpful part is, so if you or anyone ever gets notices from the city, they're going to just look at the owner on record. So they don't necessarily have a public access to everything that JWB manages. But if you send that over to your portfolio manager, that's where we have a, a really good relationship with the city. So they know once we reach out to them and, and that it's being addressed, that it's easy to close out from there. Got it. All right. Lee's also asking, what, if anything, does JWB do with the furniture or items that are left during a turn? Yeah, so that's going to normally be the first thing on the turnover is going to be any sort of debris removal, furniture, or anything comes into that. It's not anything we we flip or make an extra profit on. It's a debris removal company, and they can do what they want with it, but they're busy. So really, there's, there's really not an opportunity for them to have any sort of a side hustle with it. They're normally just making sure it gets out of the home. Got it. So just 1-800 junk control or something like that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> J-Dog. J-Dog. That's right. I love that guy. <laughs> All right. Ken Malin, he's the PHR of the first family of the Not Travage Invest Show. I'll have you know. Absolutely. Asks, does your move out inspection include a termite inspection? Question number two. Oh, well, that's question number one. No. So it's not going to be like a termite bond inspection. They're going to look at it to say if, well, not the move out inspection. When the scope writer goes, if they see any sort of termite activity, that's when they put a contingency in the estimated scope of work to have it inspected, but it wouldn't be something automatic for termites specifically. Got it. And question number two, what is your experience in having to deal with a termite problem during a turnover? Fun. So <laughs> that is one of those things where you mentioned something that could take more time. Mm -hmm. Termites is something that can take more time, but it's something that we'd address first and make sure that we get someone out there. Again, we have we have a lot of vendors who we have set up in our system with fixed line item pricing for that sort of thing. So mm -hmm. we get it out there and get those numbers over to you and get it addressed as and, quickly as possible. And the inspector, scope writer person trained in spotting termite issues. Oh, they have so much fun training they've been going through. <laughs> they, are, they are now mold specialists. Wow. They are, yeah, not, probably not anything specific with 
termites, but if they're good, they know how to spot activity for it. Feels like a good person to marry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Find all of the problems yeah. in your home. <laughs> all right. Michael Santorius, the patron Santorios of the Natural Average Vegetable Community, asks, I've been with JWB since 2016 and have experienced a few property turnovers, and I've been amazed at how quickly the home inspector gets in, provides pictures, gives me an estimate, and then repairs are completed. Can you address the difference between wear and tear versus damage that comes out of the security deposit? Also, can you address what happens if the damage is above the security deposit? Yeah, that's a really good question. So determining what is normal wear and tear is is something hard. I like to be pretty dramatic when I'm talking through this with clients of if I can see a Kool-Aid man ran through the side of your home, that is not a natural wear and tear product for me. That is a, <laughs> I have ripped doors off the hinges. I have, have messed up something. That's going to be anything yeah. that's above normal wear and tear. Paint, flooring, those are things that are going to really be based on how long you lived in the home. And there's a formula that's going to go into that with normal wear and tear. I would always recommend for any clients, don't expect anything when you're approving the scope of work. I wouldn't want you to go in and say, okay, I'm approving this for four grand, knowing that I should get two grand back from the resident because that's just, I love that. And that could be a real possibility, but I wouldn't want you to set your budgeting up that way. But we, that's where we have our specialists that's going to go through that. So with the full intent to claim process, though, if what the resident owes is above the security deposit, after that timeline, so we get the intent to claim out to the resident, they then have 20 days to dispute it. We are then going to give them an opportunity to pay us directly to avoid a collections agency at that time if it's something above the normal security deposit. After that time frame, it's going to be about 60 days. If we don't have anything additional from the resident, that's when we can then forfeit the security deposit back to the client. And then the remaining amount is going to go to a collections agency where they will professionally mediate the debt from there. So I've seen it in, in some cases where a lot of the times if a resident moves out, they're able to move into a new place before any of this is going to hit any of their backgrounds because they're they're arranging that ahead of time. But it could be Five years down the road, maybe they're trying to to buy a car now, or maybe they're trying to move at this point, that open balance is going to be on their background and on their credit reporting. So they could start trying to clear that up of saying, okay, now I'm going to start paying $50 a month or $100 a month. And we see that when we're auditing your state, VIN, we're like, what, what is that on there? And it's from a resident from 2016 that's now trying to pay off that debt. Interesting. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it sounds like the answer to that is JWB, as with all things you, you, you set expectations up front. So you know what is regular wear and tear and what isn't. And mm -hmm. then once you get to that point, then that's clearly communicated to the resident. If it goes above the security deposit, they know they have the opportunity to handle that and do what's right. If they don't have the ability to, or they choose not to, then there is the you know legal channels that do it that have more professionals working on it and kind of you know just taking care of that without having a put it on your own plate, but yeah. just making sure it's happening in the background. Yeah. And the resident's also getting a pre move out checklist. So they know everything that we're going to be looking for on that. They're going to have a checklist of their own to go through and look at all of those items. Got it. Okay. Lee's got another question. JWB does not list it for rent until after the 11th day of scope of work period. I did not say that. Well, I think <laughs> Lee is asking. So work it doesn't period. Go, yeah. <laughs> so it doesn't go for it you is not. Yeah. Yes, we do not put it on the rental market until it is rent ready condition. And that's for a plethora of reasons. We've dabbled in the pre-listing game and we have taken the data of, are we actually getting a resident moved in any quicker by pre-listing it? And the answer was no. If anything, we lost really good opportunities there because we said, hey, we're going to go ahead and market this and say that it's coming soon. You're making plans to move out. Then maybe I don't get it approved quick as quickly as I liked, or maybe yeah. there was a contingency item that we had to address. And now they have to go look for a different place. So Got it. we have a lot of benefit in waiting until it is actually rent ready. And, and a really big thing for that too, is because when a resident is renting it and placing a deposit, they are saying, I am renting this as is. So if we do it mid turn there, that could be really complicated with, well, I've, I wanted a fence or something that could be more, more cosmetic because they didn't have that same agreement. Makes sense. Great answer. And a uh, great save. Yeah. I appreciate, that. I appreciate that. Roger Evans has a question. What is the typical work warranty for JWB vetted vendors? 
So normally for any of their standard work that they're going to do, it's going to be a a 30-day warranty. If there's anything with a manufacturer, that's going to be going off the manufacturer's warranty for, for parts or labor for that. Got it. Okay. Anonymous attendee, this is a uh, regular from France that tunes in, uh-huh. asks, is it normal to, I'm sorry, <laughs> is it normal not to get any applications in a vacant rental for over 30 days after listing? Yeah. So applications that that could be possible. Uh, residents can look at homes before actually filling out a formal application. That can be scary. There's a fee associated with creating applications. So a lot of the times if residents are are really not sure that they found their forever home, they may not be creating an application for that property. There you go. All right. JC asks, should I, I don't know if I said that into the microphone. JC asks, should I expect photos of my rental when someone moves out? You should. Yes. Yep. Yeah. We, we handled that early, early in the process. There was a long laundry list of things. First thing is kind of like photos, move out, change locks, photos. Yep. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, got, got it. Cool. Lisa Thompson, Lisa, I think that's a new name. Lisa, welcome to the show. Collections. Do you continue to manage slash update owner of uh, or collection agency, what percentage does the agency keep? Thanks. Do you know about that stuff? The percentage of what they keep from it, I don't know off the top of my head. It's not something that we actively monitor because normally by that point, you have a new resident moving, living in the home, paying rent anyway, and that's the priority. And I would almost want to err on the side of caution of if it's going to collection see, collections agency, I would kind of put it out of sight, out of mind and not expect to get that money back. And then if you do, it's icing on the cake and that's great, but actively monitoring it would almost just lead to, to disappointment. To misery. Yeah. <laughs> just remembering that. Okay, cool. Uh, Jim Kirko, Jim is back. He normally watches it with his son and he's got a world-class first baseman name is what we like to call that, Jim Kirko. Right. He's asking, what is the turn process for an eviction turn in the landlord-friendly state of Florida? Yeah, so turn process is the same. The possession process is what can get a little bit different. So if a resident is going through an active position, active eviction, it, we are able to take possession of it once we have a writ of possession signed off by the judge. So that's saying it went through the whole eviction process. They are saying, okay, we are at final judgment. I'm signing off on a writ of possession. They are then coordinating, letting us know or letting our, our local sheriff's office here know. And then our sheriff o- sheriff's office is connecting with our possession team to take possession of the home. Okay. All right. There you go. I've been through that. Timing in general, for the eviction process, so normally from the time that we file an eviction, if there is no, the resident's not working with us, if they're not moving out of the home, there's a lot of areas that we can get it sooner. But if we're saying worst case scenario, we're not even hearing from the residents, normally 60 to 90 days right now. That used to be 45 to 60. COVID kind of slowed it down, everything in the court systems that we're still rebounding from. So 60 to 90 days is standard. Cool. All right. That was great questions. I oh. think that was like 13, 14, oh, 18 questions we answered today. Love it. Awesome stuff, community. That actually kind of hits on all the stuff that we wanted to bounce on. Yeah. And as we talk about this like laundry list of stuff to do, do you ever have owners that want to do this themselves or don't want to just let you handle it? Yeah. Yeah. I okay. think, I mean, we deal with a world of investors and I'm part of being a, a savvy investor doesn't always mean passive. And it means I want to save money where I can. I've had that a lot. I've had a handful try to result in them never wanting to try again. So okay. I think the biggest Makes piece sense. biggest piece of it is, is timelines and thinking. If you see a number up front, you may think that you can get it cheaper, yeah. but then when you go out on the market, it it's not, it's just the reality of, of the industry, just having price increases or the timelines, the availability, having to try to coordinate that yourself. You're not going to get it done within the amount of time that Florida statute requires for an intent to claim. So you can kiss the security deposit goodbye. And what normally I've never seen someone really successfully do that externally. And then really just trying to find approved vendors. I think the biggest horror story I've kind of seen with there is maybe the vendors weren't licensed and insured, or maybe you are still far away and you call me and say, Hey, Allie, my, my turn is ready for you to go ahead and release it to the market. And then my quality control coordinator goes out to the home and says, okay, well, I still need these five things done for this to be up to livability standard. Now I'm calling the client. They're saying they did pay for that. Yeah. And now they're trying to track down their vendor who yeah. has now ghosted them and they can't get a hold of. And now you 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 have to pay us now to do it anyway, because your person has 
fell off the radar and didn't do it properly. So it's a kind of a lack of accountability when you're using external vendors that you don't have. And then I think really the timeline is going to be the biggest thing. Can you, can you get it done as quickly with using just multiple parties? Yeah. The time spent, the quality control assurance, and you didn't even hit on pricing, right? Like the bulk pricing part of it, JWB is, I mean, I think that that data that you shared where it's like construction costs have gone up 30 plus percent, turn costs have only gone up 10%. I think that's, if that's not like a perfect snapshot of that bulk buying benefit that you get by doing this with JWB, I don't know what is, right? So like, I wouldn't want to go out there and, and compete against, you know, go go pay like public pricing instead of paying Costco pricing. Yeah. You know, for the no, same thing. No, exactly. Right? And I think yeah. I, if you find a licensed and insured vendor that can do it cheaper, I want to talk to them and I want to onboard them and I want to use them in my world. But the majority of the time, it's going to be somebody who's not licensed and insured who that's just... It could be cheaper. It's just not someone that we'd be comfortable using on our products. Let's talk about a little known thing that JWB does before we get out of here. Sure. Alex, can, can tell everybody about this little known thing that nobody knows about that you're breaking news on. Oh, my my analysis? <laughs> yeah. Yes. This is something that every time I talk to a client, I'm shocked that they do not know about. So if there is a client or maybe you are venturing into the world of real estate investments and property management, and you are not looking to do a turnkey style for for whatever that reason may be. If you are looking for a home and it's in Jacksonville and you potentially want JWB to manage it, I would love to get eyes on it for my team as a professional. So we actually offer a service. It's an analysis service where if you you said, I found this home Mm -hmm. and I think I want to buy it and I didn't find it through you, you can pay that fee. And what it is, is we will go out there to the property for you. We will do a full analysis of what we think the property is worth, what we think the the after repair value of the home is going to be. We are also going to go ahead and write a full renovation scope of work for you so you know what that is. We'll do a market analysis for you so you know what the rent would be. And we're also going to analyze it and see if we have any advice on what you should include when you're offering that back. So that is awesome because one, I've I've been in that situation where a client brings me a home. I go and say, this needs new plumbing. Your electrical panel isn't up to an insurance standard. It's This is going to now be a $35,000 renovation. Mm-hmm. And they're saying, oh, well, my realtor told me it'd be four grand. And now the numbers don't make sense. Mm-hmm. So it's mm-hmm. kind of just knowing that you have a trusted professional. We're putting it through the same pipeline we do for our acquisitions on the front end. We're putting our stamp on it of letting you know what it would take. And then you can really make an educated buying decision from there if that's going to make the most sense for you. And if it saves you a lot of money and you don't end up going through with the product, then that's $400, but a lot more than or a lot less than what it could be if you were blindsided or if you end up saying, okay, I'm good with those numbers. I'm going to go ahead and, and buy this home. You can bring it to JWB. We will then do that renovation for you. And that 400 just goes towards the renovation. So it's just your first piece in the door for that. Love that. You threw in 400, the number 400 there. That's the price. Yeah. $400. Right? Sorry. So, yeah. So 400 bucks, you get the professional inspection yeah. and scope written out by JWB, by the professional scope writer inspector person. Mm-hmm. And that is kind of like a, if you are out there finding your own property, that is your risk mitigation for not getting hosed on a property ahead of time is that JWB can give you the hey, this is the seal of approval that we would have bought this house. Yes. And this is what we would have done. And now you can sleep better at night. And then if you do buy it, you do do the work and you want JWB to manage it, it gets credited to your next turn. Yeah. Well, and we'll we'll do that renovation for you. So it could be occupied or vacant and we'll let you know what it would look like either way. Uh, so it could be, yes, when it's, if it's occupied and the turn's not going to be for a while, then that will go there. Or it's something that we can manage the renovation for you on the front end. Is there an extra cost to manage the renovation? So a renovation, if it's not one of our products that we've touched before, you will have your 10% management fee and then a 10% general condition. So it's about a 20% management fee. So that piece is is a little bit different than your normal turnover, but everything else is going to be the same. Awesome. I can't believe I'm like when you told me about this, I was like, no way. Right? Yeah, like, I, I know. No Anytime we, we, we try to advertise it, but when I talk to a client and they didn't do that or they come and I'm, I'm having a hard conversation about what all the home needs, it's always a, I wish you would have known we were full service and, and we're happy to help you mm-hmm. on the front end. Well, good news, Allie. There's going to be a now YouTube clip yeah. <laughs> specifically about this that you can now forward to everybody that you've ever met. I love it. Oh so my God. We're going we're gonna to make that happen. Rhea Patil. Rhea, that's a new name. Welcome to the show. Happy to have you. Asks, does the professional inspection extend to multifamily properties? It does. Yes. 
All right. Okay. Let me see. We got, we got a couple more questions here. All right. You ready? Five more minutes. Mm -hmm. Lisa Thompson says me again, we have built 11 homes in Jacksonville and Ocala. I reached out in January and Tierra responded to me. We wanted to see inside an in progress slash vacant property to check quality and finishes, but she said, no, since we weren't clients already, we could not meet with her, but we could drive by inventory. I'm sorry. This is long. So it's hard to see at a distance. No following up after that. We are back in Florida in October and looking at a property. So is this still your policy? Also, would you take on property management if property isn't sold by you? We are considering changing PMs. Yes. Yes. So that is a, a whole avenue of what we do. Our bread and butter is a turnkey product that we sell the product and do the property management. But we have had years of experience now taking property management from outside products. A lot of our clients have a blend. So maybe they tried a few different turnkey companies up front and now they want to consolidate all to be managed by JWB. And we do do that. So Lisa, I, I can we can look up your name. And if there's a way to get contact information from this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Then, then the registration. Or you can just go to chatwithjwb.com and just like pick out a time on the calendar. Okay. And Lisa, you can just set your own appointment. So chat, any of this stuff, right? This $400 yeah, fee, yeah. taking over property management, managing a renovation, all those things can all happen if you go to chatwithjwb.com and just pick out the time that works for you best on the calendar. So thanks, Lisa. Great question. Yeah. Happy to happy to happy to have clarified that for Absolutely you. Absolutely want to connect. All right. A couple more. The shaman Nadim says, is that if there is rug throughout the property, does JWB turn team suggest installing vinyl flooring throughout? And is vinyl flooring cheaper than rug? This is a really good question because for a long time it made more sense to replace everything with vinyl plank. And then as wood prices or, or as vinyl plank increased in pricing, it actually made sense. So now we we shifted maybe about a year and a half ago, two years ago, we shifted back to carpet just because the longevity of it, if you're replacing it on every single turnover, outlives vinyl plank. So that's something that we're going to constantly analyze the pricing on to make a decision on what's going to make the most sense for our clients. Got it. All right. right now, carpet is going to make the most sense. Cool. Good answer. Michael Santorios asks, Ali, would JWB be able to do the work if we did this? Oh yeah. So the answer is yes. I would yes. assume if you do the you do the inspection, JWB can then manage the renovation. We answered that. Yeah. Lee says, does the cost include an inspector visiting the property as well? Yeah. So it's not going to be an, an outside inspector, but it's going to be our teammate who goes through and does it. So it's not going to be a formal looking for your 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 termites or anything like that, but it, they're going to look through it and let you know really the same way that we would through our lens of what work we're going to estimate needs to be done to it. We're going to be broad there and making sure that you're you're making an offer that's going to make the most sense for you. We're not going to under pitch what that number would be because we want you to make your offer accordingly to make sure that your returns are going to make sense on that end. Cool. And last question of the day, Ringmaster Drew Barnhill says, if you do the renovation for us, does it qualify as a property towards a VIP management reduction, i.e. you get to five and it drops to 9%, and if you get to 10, it drops to 8%. Yeah, great question. So that's our elite program. So so right now, our elite program is for turnkey products, so it wouldn't go towards that count, but I would never say never. That's a good question, though, Drew. That's yeah. Sneaky, sneaky no, it is a, it is a good, hand. very good it. question. I love it. I love it. Allie, high five. Yay. That was awesome. First podcast. Yeah. First podcast. I'll be back next week. You're getting rave reviews <laughs> in the chat. So I wouldn't be surprised if you're back next week and Greg is completely displaced. <laughs> that being said, how'd it feel? You have fun? I had so much fun. Yeah. I really had no idea what to expect, but this yeah. was awesome. It's yeah. just the, the conversations we have with clients all the time. So I mean, you, you are a client. That makes sense. I am. I am a client. So this is a conversation that we would have. You answered 25 questions. We had 70 plus people here today at one point. Whoa. So you, you brought the audience. You brought the knowledge. Rave reviews. You did a great job. I want to thank the community because they are, number one, the ones that suggested this topic, which yeah. is great because every time you suggest a topic, we know that you show up for it. And that is a positive feedback mechanism. So every time you give us suggestions, we love it. We're going to do a show about it. Number two, they showed up. They asked the 25 great questions, make our job easy, right? Like Absolutely. a whole bunch of stuff that we wanted to talk about, but we didn't even have to like think about that because they asked the questions for all the stuff that we wanted to share. want to talk about what the people want to know. Which was awesome. So we just thank you. We never take it for granted that you take an hour of your day on a Tuesday to show up here. Allie, I know you're super busy. I don't take it for granted that you made yourself available to us. I really, really appreciate so it. And I'm I want to do this more. Cool. I'm in. I'm in. All right. We're going to careful what you wish for. Again, Thursday, tomorrow, there is a big announcement happening in downtown. If you are interested, 
in a sneak preview of that, what that may be, Google Gateway Jacks. They're making a big, big, big announcement downtown um, about a big project that's happening. I'm going to be there with a camera crew, get some interviews. Mm -hmm. And on Thursday, we're going to have Mr. Downtown himself. Alex Safakis. Oh, I was going to guess that, Mr. Downtown. Look at him a pageant crown. Yeah, the Tasmanian devil of Northeast Florida real estate himself is going to be here to give us all the background of this thing that they are announcing tomorrow. So stay tuned. Come on Thursday. Every time Alex comes and we call it the insider secrets and people really, really enjoy it. So it's going to be great. And hope to see you next time. What do you know? Do you know what our final call sign is? What we tell people not to do? Don't, don't be average. Don't be average. <laughs>